Welcome to Boom, where we have biomechanics on our minds. Boom. 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 Today, we are talking with Dr. Brian Weinberg and Dr. Patrick Welsh, co-directors of Athletic Movement Assessment. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks. We are really excited to chat with you too, and yeah, look forward to uh, seeing what you guys have for us. <laughs> well, we usually like to start sort of with your beginnings um, and like to show a diversity of career paths and journeys, and it seems like nobody takes like a straight path. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, you're nodding your heads. Um, we'd love to hear about your journey and when you first knew you wanted to be, you know, involved in sports and uh, sports medicine and chiropractor. You're both chiropractors. Yeah, it seems like you have so many different like, certificates yeah, so many hats. and <laughs> um, trainings. But yeah, so yeah. just tell us a little bit more about each of your stories. We'd love to hear. Yeah, I'll start. So, I mean, growing up, I was a tennis player, competitive tennis player here in uh Toronto, Canada, and worked my way up through the national level and ended up getting a, a tennis scholarship um, in the US. Uh, so I ended up playing for University of Hawaii, where I graduated. Um, throughout all my injuries, I always had a chiropractor that kind of helped me along my way. And after I was done at Hawaii, I played on the lower professional circuit level for a year, still knowing that I'd want to get into chiropractic. And then after that, got into the whole uh, chiropractic college here in Canada at uh, CMCC in Toronto. So that was a four year course there. And then coming out of school, um, started working in Mississauga. So it's a, in the greater Toronto area. And that's pretty much where we started um, athletic movement assessment, a, a seminar series. And since then, besides the seminar stuff, like you mentioned, got involved in a lot of uh, sports from an injury management side of things and also treatment. So I work with our professional football team in the Canadian Football League, uh, the Toronto Argonauts, and as well our professional rugby team, the uh, Toronto Arrows. So did that and this past Olympics, the 2020 Olympics, which was held in 2021, even though they still called it the yeah. Olympics. I was the Cairo for the uh, badminton Canada team as well. So, wow. um, so yeah, just, you know, it's a good change working with athletes. I still mm -hmm. obviously enjoy working with the general public as well. Everybody's an athlete in their own right. Everybody has to sit and stand and uh, I just love helping people out. Oh, yeah, it's um, cool to go from one side to the other, like you were an athlete being helped by chiropractors and then you got to kind of pay it forward. Yeah, it definitely makes you appreciate the other side that you don't see. So uh, mm -hmm. it was it was definitely eye opening. Mm. Yeah, um, go for it, Patrick. I, my path uh, might look sort of planned out and linear, but it it sort of was just <laughs> a natural progression. Um, I did an exercise science degree at the University of Calgary and was working as a trainer for a number of years with general population, with some professional hockey players, and got connected with a chiropractic neurologist, which um, and he was doing a lot of really uh, forward thinking things. He thought outside the box and really piqued my interest in how um, you can help people. And I decided at some point I didn't want to be the one referring to him. I wanted to be the one fixing and helping the patients. And, Sort of that led me into the, the chiropractic profession and, and throughout that time I worked in a number of sports in hockey and soccer and ended up doing a postdoctoral uh, degree in sports sciences, which got me sort of interested more in research. Uh, I did some biomechanics research um, and I spend sort of part of my time working with various uh, multi-sport games, um, mm -hmm. the Canada Winter Games I was recently at and I travel with Floorball Canada. So many of you won't know what floorball is but it's a big European sport, it's kind of like ball hockey. And uh, I travel with the national team uh, when I get some spare time as well. So a mixed bag, we, Brian and I, we see some, we see athletes, we see general population people and sort of everyone in between. Mm. How do you feel like working with the athletes versus the general population um, is similar or different? 
I mean, they both have their physical demands. Um, those demands just differ in, in, in frequency and loading. And, and mm -hmm. uh, the big thing I, I notice is that your athletes, especially professional athletes, they get a lot more recovery time. Um, they have dedicated mm -hmm. training hours um, and they have a lot of recovery time available. When you look at the everyday mm -hmm. person who sits all day, all they do is sit. And while that may not seem like a physical endeavor, it's certainly putting some stress on the body. Mm. And they're sitting at home and sitting at work and just doing that over and over again. There's not a good recovery from that position. So we mm. talk about sort of the, the load to recovery ratio and, and, and bringing that analogy in for our general population patients helps them understand why recovery is important. So there's some, some similar similarities, some differences for sure. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, we'd love to learn more about what you do at Athletic Movement Assessment. I think we're really excited to have you on because I think often we're focused on this research side of biomechanics mm -hmm. and we haven't talked to too many people who are actually um, practicing with athletes and people and actually putting the research in biomechanics into practice. What does this look like in everyday life? Um, and how, how are we translating that um, and actually using that to help people? Um, so we're really excited to, to learn more about that. But yeah, first, if you could just give a general overview of AMA. Yeah. So what it is, it's a criterion based assessment. And what we do is we try to make it very relevant and contextual to the person in front of you. So, you know, we wouldn't assess a baseball player the same way we would assess a hockey player because the demands are quite different. And mm -hmm. so we try to modify it based off of the person in front of you. And mm -hmm. it's something that we teach. So it's a three part seminar series. So we have an upper extremity, a lower extremity, and then we have a therapeutics one for practitioners. And we find the majority of the people coming to take the seminar and who's it's for are you know, healthcare practitioners, chiros, physios, ATs, and as well as a lot of, um, you know, strength and conditioning coaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, we find just trying to combine them all together. And that way we all have, you know, similar language that we use very, very important. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, our model is really looking at movement through a different lens. We're, we're sort of looking at the confluence of several domains of science. So biomechanics, mm -hmm. Uh, pathophysiology, neurology, pain science, and motor learning. And we're trying to, when we look at it through our biomechanical lens, we're really seeing what our athlete or what our patient can do with their body. And the criterion mm -hmm. that Brian referenced has to be contextualized to that person. So we can't expect a 12 year old to move the same way as a 55 year old. And we know that sport adaptations are also going to change how people move. So our model is always sort of tweaking the assessment process to match the demands of that athlete or that sport, or even for that general population person who has normal tasks of daily life. Wow. That, I feel like that personalized approach is becoming more and more popular. Like you see, you know, in, in almost every field, like we're figuring out how to sort of better personalize medicine and treatment and therapy, you name it, training. Um, but how, yeah, is this, is this new in your field, you know, like bringing together all these different people and like um, Brian, you mentioned speaking the same language. How do you do that? How do you kind of, um, you know, get everyone on the same page, but also benefit from the diversity of perspectives that you're bringing in? Yeah. So, I mean, we set out again, a criteria and we go over, you know, some of the definitions of words because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, depending on what school of thought you have, th they're going to differ a little bit. And so mm -hmm. we try to make sure that we're all speaking that common language. And as we go through the assessments and we go through teaching, you know, the AMA thought process. And again, it is a thought process. Like we don't go through a cookie cutter approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we try to link things together from again, a therapeutics, but also performance viewpoint. Yeah. And I would just say that, you know, when we're trying to get people to speak the same language, we're, we go back to first principles of movement science, biomechanics, mm -hmm. like people should understand torque, people should understand, you know, mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. pr 
principles of science at the basic level. And so we, we kind of bring everyone back down to that common language. Mm -hmm. and, and our whole model is based off of those sort of multiple domains I spoke about, motor learning, biomechanics, yeah. and so on. So I, I feel like if we get people in that realm with enough of the similar, similar definitions, similar tools, then we have a good starting point to end up at the same place in the end. Mm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of those that foundational mm -hmm. knowledge, and then you can build upon that. Um, and I guess then better help like personalize it or kind of, um, yeah, expand mm -hmm. upon that. I'm curious when you're bringing in – so you have this foundational knowledge, but then I'm sure you also – bring in new information and new knowledge and you know, there's always new research coming out. And mm -hmm. I'm curious more on that side, how you get the information that you're sharing with people and how you're bringing in or potentially, um, yeah, applying new research, like how you make sure that's um, relevant or like accurate and you should be using it, like um, mm -hmm. how you sort of pick through different um, information that you're that you might be coming across. Um, I think this could be really helpful as biomechanists and researchers to um, understand then how like when we write a paper or something like that, how it's actually being used um, or taken mm -hmm. and then applied. So if you could talk more about what that looks like from your side, that would be really interesting. For sure. And you bring up a really good point about that because it understanding how to critically appraise research and, and, and break it down is a skill that takes years and years of training um, mm -hmm. to understand what good research, especially in today's world where people mm -hmm. just want yeah. snippets of information, it's, it's, it's highly complicated and it, it, it takes some in, intentional effort. My postdoctoral program was two years of looking at papers and deciding is this good or not and why. And there's, mm -hmm. it's not a, this is good or this is bad it's a continuum and so how much are you mm -hmm. willing to give and how much are you willing to take what i think you're asking is how do we take that stuff on the paper and put it into practice and we first have to always apply our principles we look through the research with our ama lens which our principles mm -hmm. um you know we teach in our course one of them being relevancy so what does this have to do with this particular athlete profile. So we might look at mm -hmm. some biomechanical research on, you know, mm -hmm. knee alignment from a vertical drop jump and looking at dynamic knee valgus. How does that even translate mm -hmm. into risk of injury on the soccer pitch? Well, we mm -hmm. know that, and we look at all of those fields of science I talked about together, pain science, motor learning, biomechanics, mm -hmm. we're taking little snippets from these areas of research and seeing where they to apply and to what degree. And in some cases, mm -hmm. a paper will really give us a lot of useful, applicable stuff. And other times it'll give us just a little piece. It'll give us, you know, a little clinical pearl. It'll give us a, you know, one extra piece of information we can use to inform our decision making. So mm -hmm. based on the quality of the paper, based on the degree to which it can actually influence change, you know, we're going to filter that through our principles and, and take what we can mm -hmm. from and that's why we're always, our model is always changing. It's always, it's always different. We let people audit and come back as many times as they want because mm -hmm. every year our, our manual is different. The research we pull in is new. Mm -hmm. I think that you have to have a flexible mindset because it, all this stuff is going to continue to evolve. We're never going to reach the end point. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that mindset is so key in so many aspects, but especially this one in, um, especially in science, right? Like nothing, like, uh, once someone once said like, oh, I want to be proven wrong. Like, I hope that my like research paper is someday proven wrong. Right. Because like, that is the expectation that we're going to grow and evolve beyond. Like, hopefully we don't just stay static in some of these truths. Um, and so I really appreciate that mindset. And I'm wondering how you might like, um, communicate that to the participants that you work with, like to athletes and things like that. How, um, you know, you're teaching these experts how to how to take on this framework, but what are you, how do you translate that to the, the people that you're actually helping to? Yeah, from, so like our, our patients or, you know, for training yeah. someone, um, we really, I always personally start with trying to guesstimate someone's health literacy, like 
what kind of language should I use to meet them where they are? Mm -hmm. You know, as chiropractors, we also have lots of people come in with some really old school ideas about what we do in general. <laughs> and and the, the world's current obsession with static postural alignments, uh, you know, on social mm -hmm. media, and, and we could speak to the, the validity or lack thereof of that. But mm -hmm. you want to sort of A, meet them where they're at, and then B, just start with simple principles that are going to help them. If you take a patient with back pain, you know, who's load intolerant, they can't lift something. You might teach them about torque and how there's more torque, the mm. further away something gets from your body. So keep, you know, when you're doing the dishes, get really close to the sink so that you don't have to reach as far and put mm. as much torque through your back. So really simple approaches like that from a pain perspective, but you know, obviously we get more complicated, in the sport realm and how we use that information. Yeah. And it's, you know, you get the buy-in from the patient and the athlete when not only can they see the changes, but also feel the changes. And I think just mm -hmm. having an open communication with them, you know, you're always communicating whether you're treating them, assessing them or going through, you know, rehab or, or, or training, you're, you're going to, mm -hmm. you, you want to hear, okay, what are you feeling? You know, and then, you know, from a visual standpoint, you know, what does that actually look like? And, mm. you know, does it matter? You know, there's, there's, you know, there's no pass fail, you know, mm. no dysfunction. Like we don't like to use the word something's dysfunctional because, hmm. you know, things change. And if somebody has, you know, going back to what Patrick was talking about, knee valgosity, well, you got to put into context who that person is, what sport they do. And, you know, if they're a break dancer and their knee needs to go into that dynamic valgos valgosity, okay, maybe you'll allow for that. Whereas in other contexts and other situations, you might not. So, you know, it's putting it all together. And again, like I said at the beginning, you, you got to think and um, we, we try to simplify it as best we can. But, you know, there is still that, uh, you know, that 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 need for for the person taking the seminar to, to think and mm -hmm. understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, that's true. And I feel like with people, you're probably always seeing, I mean, no one is alike, right? So you're probably also just being presented with new cases all the time or things that might be surprising to you. Um, I'm curious if there's any ever been, I, I know you probably can't like give details of this, but I'm wondering <laughs> if you ever have had a client that, you know, was maybe you had to like apply different principles that you like haven't before I like had to it brought together all of these you talked about some like neuromechanics and pain science and um I'm wondering if there's like an example of bringing that in and how that supports biomechanics because I think sometimes that can maybe feel a little bit um ambiguous like mm -hmm. or hard to um I think it's not as easy to explain as biomechanics, which you're like applying mechanical principles to the body, but like, are mm -hmm. there cases where, you know, you can, you can think on where you've brought in these other principles of pain science and it's really like helped supported their treatment. Yeah. I mean, it, it's absolutely critical. We, when we're teaching, we tell people like you have 10 people with patellar tendonitis, they could all have different causative factors and they could all have different pain generation factors. So mm. purely biomechanically, if you land stiff, mm. don't have a lot of dorsiflexion and hip flexion, well, the patellar tendon is just going to take more load. But if that person is a highly tuned athlete and well rested, they might tolerate that, that mm. insult, that, that training session. Mm. But if you take mm -hmm. someone who's a diabetic and a smoker and you get them starting their boot camp, and they jump with that stiff landing style, they're going to get a patellar tendonitis much quicker. Mm -hmm. So now we're trying to mm -hmm. navigate the situation where we have to understand tissue pathophysiology. We have to understand biomechanics. We have to understand motor learning, neurology, all of these things at once, because mm -hmm. five people with the same diagnosis of back pain or patellar tendonitis are going to have different avenues that they need to go down in order to recover. Mm -hmm. So when you said, mm -hmm. you know, we're always dealing with different cases. Yeah. I mean, every patient is an N equals one study and mm -hmm. you have to be flexible in your thinking, not just mm -hmm. think within a particular filter and be able to look through all of these lenses at once to give yourself mm -hmm. options. 
and you just feel so much more comfortable knowing like, yeah, like I can treat this, this is my wheelhouse or no, that type of pain is, you know, due to an inflammatory arthritis, and you need medication. Like you need to understand, you know, what's within your scope of practice and, and how to mm. best identify what people need. Mm. I'm curious how you, if there's tools to quantify these different um, aspects of a per- So some of the things that you're mentioning are more like lifestyle um, or demographic. Um, what are other ways that you can actually measure some of these um, parameters that you're you're talking about that you would consider in their um, in their treatment and then I guess maybe this is a different question but I'm curious about outcomes and what you would consider a successful outcome then um, I'm sure that also varies by the person um, so I'm kind of also curious about how you determine those um, and and sort of quantify that as well. Yeah. Okay. So from the measurement standpoint, I mean, we can measure all sorts of things with angles and strength. Mm-hmm. You know, for most of my ex- upper extremity patients, I'm testing grip strength because we know it has a lot of, mm-hmm. you know, correlation with upper extremity and even total body strength. Um, but there are other things that we might want to measure that predict their potential success in a treatment plan, like their, their heart rate, their blood pressure, their Mm -hmm. oxygen saturation. These are signs that the system is working hard or not. If you get an increase in 10 beats per minute of your resting heart rate, first thing in the morning, it's a sign of overtraining. And there's other ways we can monitor Mm -hmm. load in our athletes, whether that's with GPS tracking systems and and things like that so those are some of the ways that we might measure other useful outcomes because we don't always Mm -hmm. want to leave it especially in the clinical setting to just pain and you know pain Mm -hmm. is a very subjective Mm -hmm. rating um Mm -hmm. and you know when you're talking about outcomes a lot of people 90 percent of people who come into our practice are coming in with a pain problem and so when they Mm -hmm. feel maybe not even in all of their pain is gone. Some people just want their eight out of 10 to be a four and then they're done with you. That's, mm. that's a successful outcome for them. And so there's different ways. There's both functional and, you know, pain and disability type of questionnaires in our, in, in our field where it's like, are we just talking about pain? Or are we asking them questions about what they can and can't do, you mm-hmm. know, and, and that objectivity, mm-hmm. those objective measures are really important because pain is, Pain is a great liar and pain is <laughs> separate from biomechanical issues. And so we want to make mm-hmm. sure we're measuring both in order to ensure people are feeling good about the, the path they're on and not just worrying about pain and thinking about function as well. Yeah. And from like an assessment standpoint, and I don't know if you were alluding to it, but like, do we measure things and we do a bit, but it's not, you know, an all or nothing because What you have to understand is if you're looking at, for instance, range of motion, it's going to be different, you know, hour to hour for somebody. Like if they just woke up versus they warmed up, they're ready to go. So you can't, you know, put your hat, you know, on that, on that one K range of motion test because you can manipulate it. Mm -hmm. And our paradigm that we use with AMA, we, we try to manipulate the nervous system in order to create that change. Again, whether it's a feeling of stiffness, a feeling of pain, or improving that excursion. So if we're solely basing our assessment on just measuring joint angles, um, right. again, the great liar as well, because mm-hmm. it's, it's not going to be the same, you know, throughout time. Yeah, I love this approach, because I feel like oftentimes, I mean, I felt it in my own research, I felt it, you know, um, in, in other clinical areas, but um, like you just want something that's going to be a catch all, right? You just want to track one thing and, you know, that works for everyone. And like, um, but I, I think that this approach is much more realistic and much more, right, like impactful and effective. Um, and, and to have that mindset to be so comprehensive, not only in the tools you're using, the measures you're using, but also in like the empathy you're using and with your patients, right? And trying to understand sort of the context and what actually, you know, a good outcome means for them 
not just, um, you know, biomechanically. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons why we started AMA was like in chiropractic college, a lot of it is when you're assessing somebody using orthopedic tests, but the problem Mm -hmm. is a lot of the times when somebody comes in a patient athlete or what have you, they don't have an orthopedic problem. So <laughs> if all your orthopedic tests fail, all of them are negative. It's like, well, okay, well, what do you do with that person in front of you? Yeah. And if you're a trainer and you have somebody come in to see you and say you're, you're assessing them and you're, you're grading them. Okay. It's a one out of 10 or three out of 10. It's like, okay, well, what does that even mean? And then what do you do with it? And so mm-hmm. we created this because we, we've taken other assessment and screening courses out there. And at the end of the day, you're left with the question of, so what, what do you do with it? It doesn't really help guide what you're going to do with the, with the athletes and patient in front of you. And what we try to do in our seminar series is when people leave, they should know exactly what to do with their patient and their athlete when, when they leave and the assessment helps guide that. Okay. Like, do they need, do they need treatment? Do they, right. need mm-hmm. rehab? do they go in the ther- you know, in the, um, you know, the training stream or, okay, you need to re- re- referring out, you need to get out and you need to see somebody else. And, mm. so, and so that's, you know, the gist of why we, you know, created this, this, this paradigm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. I've, it's been really interesting to learn about it in this perspective. And, um, uh, is there anything else that you want to share about AMA or, um, mm-hmm. Any surprises you (laughs) run into or challenges like, yeah, like. Well, I I think a lot, you know, for, for people that know the space in terms of, you know, different types of assessment, we, we work with a lot of students too, who ask Mm -hmm. us uh, about these other types of things. And Mm -hmm. I think what's important and the message we always try to get across is that you need to consider the individual in front of you and have a flexible thought process when you're assessing and leave, try to leave as much bias behind you because Mm. you go into an assessment and you have a finite set of tools, your expectations about what you're going to see are going to be limited. And when something falls outside of that, that Mm -hmm. expectation, you, you can be stuck. So rather than trying to ascribe to a particular model, you should have a flexible lens with which you can adapt to any situation. And so I I think whenever we're, you know, people ask us, what other information do I need to know? You need to go back to the first principles of a lot of this information, the things that a lot of people like to ignore in school. They like to just get through their (laughs) biomechanics lecture or their pathology lecture, but there's that stuff will be useful at some point in your educational career. And so going back to the first principles of motor learning and biomechanics and pain science, neurology and and anatomy, all of those things together are slowly going to mold your thought process over time and make you adaptable Mm -hmm. to any situation, any patient presentation uh, that comes in front of you. And in the end, you just also have to accept that you don't have every answer. You're not going to be able to fix Mm -hmm. it. When you get comfortable with that, then, then things get a lot better. Well said. I don't, I'm not going to add anything to that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sort of on that note of like when you don't, you sometimes you just don't have the answer. We often like to ask people about like a time when they feel like they failed or like haven't, you know, um, or at least haven't met their goal. Um, and so is there a story there that you might share, whether it's from your practice, teaching, life? Um, yeah, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. And again, I think it goes back to, you know, just getting through college and becoming a new grad (laughs) and again going back to patrick's story about like a tendinopathy or tendinitis of the knee a knee is not a knee is not a knee so they might have the same diagnosis and you know especially at the beginning of of my my career you're treating and giving the exact same exercises because somebody has low back pain it's like you're given these three exercises everybody's getting the same thing and sometimes yes they get better and sometimes they don't so you need an alternative view and an alternative explanation of what you're going to do with that person. Because mm-hmm. like, I like to quote, uh, one of our professors at college, Dr. Ross, you know, different people are different. 
So <laughs> you don't to live by. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you don't realize that, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. And you know, yeah. in the beginning, you know, mistakes were made and mistakes are still made. Like you're still gonna make it. You're gonna always trying to improve. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's no you know, system that covers everything. You got you gotta right. take a little bit from everybody and mm-hmm. put it all together as best you can. Yeah, for me, I think uh, one of the biggest mistakes I made was um, assuming people are always going to listen to my recommendations. <laughs> so, I, you know, you go in with certain expectations about, um, you know, how this plan of management is going to go for someone. And I was a trainer for a long time, too. And I, for every pay- person I had achieved their fitness goals, I had people who didn't as well. And Mm-hmm. And it's being able to leave aside your preconceived ideas and try to really meet people where they are. So it's not even a specific scenario. I can say I've made that mistake to various degrees um, with different clients and patients over the years. But it's, mm. In the end, it's like it's not going to be a perfect road to the outcome. But mm-hmm. as long as you and your client or patient agree that you've come to a satisfactory result, then that's the ultimate goal. And and Mm-hmm. And like what I said earlier, it's like just being comfortable with a bit of uncertainty goes a long way, which I, I definitely wasn't uh, early on in my career. I thought everyone's just going to drop and give me 20 push-ups. And... <laughs> okay, Doc. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Have you found any ways that are helpful in getting people to follow the <laughs> protocol? I think about going to my physical therapist and I maybe then the one right now, I think my mindset is very different from what it has been in the past when it comes to physical therapy and knowing that it's a really long process. And I mean, I probably do like Mm -hmm. 75% to 80% maybe of the things that she tells me to do. And she's like, every time it's like, wow, like this is, it's like amazing that you're actually listening to me. I'm like, I'm not even doing all the things that you're saying, (laughs) but I'm trying to do it the best I can. Um, And I can imagine that um, that's, yeah, not always the case and i think sometimes we want a quick fix um and especially like with long term when you don't see changes right away or improvements right away it can be a little discouraging um what has worked for you in terms of helping people um yeah really be in it for the the long haul and stick to some of their plans well there's a few things you've touched on there that i think are important Uh, certainly the quick fix mentality is is a big problem especially in today's Mm -hmm universal the the inventor of the universal scroll needs to be condemned for life because that's just not a healthy way to learn and look Mm. brian and i will treat instagram injuries now because people have tried these things to fix your back pain that weren't oh no Mm. Um, but you know looking at your scenario where you say (laughs) you know you are you're doing 75 percent of it you could ask yourself, why are you only doing 75%? And you don't need to answer that. I'm not interviewing you here. But (laughs) when you you think about that, is there a reason that person isn't bought in all the way? And even going back to our model of helping people feel the change, like when we're here, we want people to feel the change that will satisfy that, that quick fix idea, but educating them appropriately to say, this is the process and this is why. You know, nobody mm. will argue with me that a, bo- a broken bone takes six weeks to heal. So I mm. tell them a bone takes six weeks to heal. Cartilaginous or ligamentous tissue takes longer. It takes 40, 50 weeks sometimes. So helping people and encouraging people that based on the timeline, they are where they should be. That's maybe going to help solve some of those problems. But when you ask mm. some people, some people are going to come in and see you all the time just so they can continue to abuse their body. I used to train a guy that uh, I only work out with you in order to make sure I can eat cheesecake on the weekend. I said, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Like we're on the same page. That's here. your yeah, goal. That, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Honesty. That's right. Yeah. No, I think that's a big part. Like getting that compliance is, you know, can they see it? Can they feel it? And they need to understand it's the communication. Because if they don't mm. see the benefit of doing an exercise, then why would you continue, you know, continue mm-hmm. doing it? Mm-hmm. And if you can alleviate somebody's pain or improve somebody's range of motion and you can show them immediately from that exercise and that doesn't always happen, but if it does, it definitely goes a long way. And if it doesn't happen again, just, just the communication with the person is to, okay, 
here's why you're doing this exercise and you know maybe putting some research behind it saying okay the research shows this here's how long it's going to take and having realistic outcomes and goals is, mm -hmm. is, is a huge part as well mm -hmm. yeah yeah that that makes a lot of sense um and i and i like that you are both touching on not just thinking about an individual's lifestyle or these different measures that you're taking of their health, but then also what their goals are and what's important to them. Um, and, and we've talked a little bit about Instagram now. You, you brought up the term in, um, Instagram injury. And and I've seen so many different accounts now that are teaching uh, biomechanics or sports medicine. And some of them really are great quality videos and really um, – uh, it really grab your attention and it's like easy to learn from, but maybe not necessarily accurate information. Um, I was wondering if you could, this, I was thinking about this in the context of asking, asking you how people can learn more about you and thinking about your Instagram and how it's really, um, it's quite educational and, but also interesting enough to like grab your attention. Um, um, so I guess I was wondering if you could one share share that and how people can learn about you, but then also um, maybe some of the things that they could expect to like learn from your account and how it might differ from other accounts that um, might be trying to teach biomechanics, but maybe not. Um, I'd be I guess at risk at, of injuring people. Yeah, I mean, to me, my my gut is always that the higher the production value, the better the video looks, the more I wonder about the quality of, of the content. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. You know, when uh, our purpose with Instagram um, should be to, you know, win the algorithm, but we focus more on what's the quality of the stuff we're putting out rather than mm -hmm. worrying about necessarily, oh, is it every day? Um, and, and we're really trying to help people translate going back to one of your earlier questions research into practice. So a lot of our posts are going to be, here's a scenario or here's a, a patient presentation. What does the research do to dictate something, you know, actionable, actionable use of research is really what we want because very often people either ignore the research or they are research restricted and they go, well, this meta analysis says, you know, you can't do anything like, well, that's not going to help the patient when they're sitting in front of you. So right. for us, we're really looking about the actionable use of research, um, whether or not our page looks sexy, that's for you, anybody else to decide. But <laughs> we're about quality over quantity in, in, in that regard. Yeah. Well, I think your page does look sexy. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's a nice, consistent branding, right? Like you've yeah. got your sort of three columns of content. Yeah. Sorry. I told you they look <laughs> Okay, you won't find us on TikTok, but uh, I learned enough about Instagram. Okay, that yeah, I knew the yeah. Columns were your aesthetics about. are good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think it's right for the audience, right? Like we've we've thought we've had similar yeah. conversations, and we're like, do we really need to put a dance to this information? Like, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's more focused on the actual content itself more than. Um, the presentation of it, I guess, sometimes, but yeah. and it's okay <laughs> to have some uh, edutainment, as somebody once told us, so, like, because uh, yeah, yeah. you need to grab people's attention today. But you know, we're, we're into the long term quality relationships with people mm. where in our field, if you're honestly not putting in long hours of, of study to get where you need to be, you're not going to be able to confidently answer anybody's question the patient comes in and says well why does why is this happening to me you're either going to make something up and sound confident or you can actually be confident because you put in the time doing the the boring study that doesn't make the the reels mm. Mm. brian were you gonna say something i can't remember anymore <laughs> <laughs> well would you mind just sharing your instagram and any other places that people should or can follow you and learn yeah. more about yeah so uh instagram athletic movement assessment and then we usually feed things onto our twitter from there we post more on um on instagram but it, it feeds on to i think it's at assess movement is our handle for twitter and then on facebook athletic movement assessment 
as well. We always talk about we got to get better with our social media. Like our stuff is more word of mouth as opposed to mm -hmm. um, our Instagram and stuff. But we do, like Patrick said, we try to post good content, which is probably why we don't post all the time because we're always looking and and we're trying to do it in a in most times and not when we're you know in a, in a in a way to make people laugh and uh, a little bit more <laughs> entertainment and. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of where you can find us. And our website is athleticmovementassessment.com is where you can find out more about the seminars and they have some links to some other blog posts and uh, various things like that. So, yeah. Thanks. That's great. And yeah, I'm sure people will follow. We, we've been following so that it's been really fun and I feel like I've learned a lot already. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, we're coming up on our last question here. Um, what are you most excited about for the future of, let's say, athletic movement assessment? You talked about, you know, um, sort of your past, your present, how you're using this now. What do you imagine it in the future? Yeah, I mean, we're uh, looking to grow, expand into new markets. We've been across North America and into Asia, and we're going wow. to incorporate some, um, you know, online modules as well, some e-learning type mm -hmm information which i think people will like and you know two hour snippets or something like that um and we really believe that this model should be uh, a staple in standard athletic care for all major types of sports teams we the the professional teams we've worked with in hockey and canadian football and in the nfl and other teams um, they really appreciate what we bring to the table and that buy-in that the athletes get. And when you're working with that kind of, you know, expensive athlete, you want them bought in. So our vision is to grow it across major sports, get some online educational material because people always want more. Um, we just got to put the time in and, and get it out there. So hopefully by, you know, 2023, you'll see some of that information and that's where we're headed. Perfect. Well, we're excited for it. <laughs> yeah, 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 we are. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for talking with us. This was such a cool conversation and, mm -hmm. and quite different than the conversations we've had, but I feel like I've learned a lot and it's really made me think differently about how the research that we're doing can be translated, how we can educate, mm -hmm. you know, not just other researchers, but, you know, athletes and patients and other and clinicians and mm -hmm. um, bringing in these different disciplines to really have a more holistic mm -hmm. assessment and understanding of people. So thank you for sharing all of that with us. Thank you for the great work that you do. And we're excited to keep following and, and staying in touch. Thanks for the opportunity. We appreciate you having us on. Yeah. Thanks for having us. It was awesome. Biomechanics, Biomechanics off our minds. minds.